Greetings, Bob Ulrich here with the Prophecy Watchers team here in Oklahoma City. By now you've probably heard the news. There's an asteroid hurtling towards planet Earth at 28,000 miles an hour. It's called Apophis, and according to NASA, it's scheduled to arrive on Earth on April 13th, 2029, Friday the 13th. Tom Horn, of course, has talked about it in his books, The Wormwood Prophecy and The Messenger. And uh, we're here today to discuss biblical astronomy, uh, the gospel and the stars, Apophis, just a whole series of fascinating, fascinating information. Gary Stearman is here. Gary, great to have you back. It's good to be back, Bob. You know, we've got a couple of books, actually more than a couple of books here on the table, but uh, <clears throat> a couple of them here are The Gospel uh, in the Stars by Joseph Seiss, and E.W. E. Bullinger wrote a book called The Witness of the Stars, in which he pointed out the numerous ways that God is seen in the heavens. And Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Uh, it says a lot more, but I'll stop with that first verse. Uh, we are looking toward the heavens in these days, and it seems like everybody's looking toward the heavens. The satellites are going up. The telescopes are going up. People want to go to Mars. People want to go to the moon. And uh, God is there. God is there. Thank you. Mondo, God gave Job a little bit of a lecture in the book of Job, didn't he? And, and he used a word that some people may never have heard about called Mazareth. What does that actually mean? You know, the, this is the Hebrew word which we understand as the, the English word zodiac. And uh, not, not, not talking about astrology, we know certainly that uh, that word Satan likes to, um, he likes to corrupt all the things that are true, for sure. But this is simply just a, it's a, even astronomy, they'll, they'll use it, they'll talk about the ecliptic, which is the, the line that as we look at towards the sun, the, the sun as we're going around, uh, depending on your perspective, which we believe we're <laughs> heliocentric, but um, there's constellations. God has created constellations. And so as we're observing the sun, as we go around it, there's the background stars uh, behind the sun. There's 12 of them. They're called the zodiac or the ecliptic or the Maseroth in Hebrew and it appears in Job 38. So it's, this is a biblical idea. But what does it represent? Some people call this the gospel and the stars. How does that fit in? Yeah, I mean, what, what you have is, uh, historically speaking, you have these constellations that are very unique to Earth. And the, the, these, um, the constellation story, the constellation uh, descriptions, the names of the stars, and the, the imagery that goes behind them, uh, it, this is thousands of years old, and the, the idea is that what are the, you have, a, I'll say it this way, you have a commonality uh, in, the, in the story behind these constellations. No different than when you look at uh, 200 different flood stories, flood stories that go in all these different ethnic groups throughout the history of the world, but they have a commonality to them that there was a great flood at one time, there was somebody saved, there was a judgment. And in the same way, uh, even though they're different, there's a common theme to them. And when you look at the idea of the, the zodiac stars, and here in these, these books and the writers, they talk about the gospel and the stars. There's a common theme of this idea of redemption, which that's what we find fascinating that if we go back and we imagine that God could have done anything He wanted, uh, He could have created a uniform, uh, all the stars being the same and just a whole bunch of blank lights. No, He, he created these constellations to be seen specifically and uniquely from Earth that have a story behind them. And that's the exciting part. So long before we had the written Word of God, we had the Gospel and the stars that God We did. Job about. <clears throat> and you know Psalm 19 says this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read a couple of verses. Uh, Psalm 19 verses 6 and 7. His going forth is from the end of heaven and His circuit from the end into the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And what he's doing here is connecting the idea of astronomy with the idea of salvation. God's salvation is written in the stars. You know, we go from one constellation from Virgo all the way to Leo the lion. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of those, just similar to telling a story God tells the whole story 
from creation to redemption. It's actually a beautiful picture. And when he, you know, he uses the word Mazareth in the book of Job. Yeah. So when people hear the word Zodiac, you know, they panic that, you know, these guys are discussing astrology. Well, no, we're discussing the actual word God used in the book of Job, the word Mazareth, and that is the gospel and the stars. So where are we going with all this? Yeah. We've got Apophis, this asteroid heading towards Earth. We know we've got the gospel and the stars. Uh, our ministry is a little bit different from many ministries. That probably would be an understatement, right? I like to think that we're unique. We cover subjects that other ministries don't cover. We cover subjects that some people find a little bit strange. We talk about UFOs. We talk about the Nephilim. We talk about the signs in the heavens. We talk about things that are in the Bible without exception. Everything we talk about here at Prophecy Watchers is in the Bible. Sometimes people don't know that, but my uncle, who's a pastor uh, in New Jersey for quite a while, has a favorite saying that God meets people wherever they are on the road of life. He reaches people in different ways with the gospel message. Now that may be through John 3.16, which is wonderful. In this case, it may be through the whole interest in UFOs. I want you to talk about young people today, most of whom are unchurched, and how there are times where the subject like the Nephilim or UFOs kind of opens a door and draws people in. And once they actually get to hear the gospel message that this is actually in the Bible, you know, there's opportunity for us to reach people at a different place in life. You know, when you, when you think about that, I mean, I was a youth pastor for really most of my adult life. And, and you know, we as parents or grandparents or uncles and aunts, we, we recognize that the young people are leaving the church and they're they're not they're not coming back, and, and we wonder why why. And so, what well, I think in the big scheme of things is we try to look at um, ways to reach them. And when you think of social media, um, people now are being drawn in. God is using these very what we would call fringe topics uh, to to gain their interest, and then uh, because oftentimes again as as a pastor. Um, I wasn't necessarily preaching on the Nephilim every Sunday, you know, because you preach the entire council. So the Nephilim or, or some of these other topics um, are they, they are very small portions. But however, if you start talking about these topics, the, the young people are like, hey, the Bible has that. And, and to me, First Peter 3.15, that the Bible tells us to always be ready to give an answer, a defense for the reason of the hope that you have within you. And I think as biblical uh we take the whole council, we have a biblical worldview. So when we talk about these other topics, we want to say, yeah, the Bible talks about that. The Bible addresses it, not necessarily on every page, but we want to have an answer, a biblical answer for not only the gospel, uh, which we know is true, but for these other topics. And so as, as, as people are interested, we, we seek to draw them in to say the Bible has a full worldview. But then as they come in, say, by the way, the Bible talks about this, but it also provides the answer for salvation. Gary, you pastored a church here in Oklahoma City for 35 years. Yes. You've pretty much seen and done it all. Now, what you may not know about Gary Stearman, of course, Gary comes from a family of aeronautical geniuses, the inventors of the Stearman aircraft, a family history. Uh, when Amelia Earhart appears at your dining room table when you're a child, to me, that's <laughs> kind of interesting. But the history of your family is fascinating, but most people don't realize that you're an astronomy expert. Most people don't realize that we have another one here on my left. Both of these guys know more about the gospel and the stars than I've ever forgotten. Well, I wouldn't call myself an expert, but I have been an amateur astronomer for many, many years. And I got interested in astronomy because I was interested in things like I just read, Psalm 19, to talk about the heavens, they talk about the, the motions of uh, objects in the heavens and how God uses those to illustrate salvation, uh, biblical principles of all sort. And he uses, I think, the heavens to declare his own glory. And when you look at those pictures, mm. Mondo, the Hubble telescope pictures, the, how many galaxies are there out there? You know, it's interesting because uh, now with James Webb scope, uh, it makes Hubble look like it's the little brother, truly. And some of the articles that are coming out now are, and this isn't an exaggeration, but they're doing the best they can. 
they find the dark, darkest part of the sky, put, you know, aim a telescope there and just absorb the light. And they're talking upwards of one to two trillion galaxies now. I mean, it used to be, well, maybe it's a couple hundred billion. Now it's in the trillions. And then each galaxy having one to 200 billion stars, it's, it's the, the, the equivalent is how many galaxies are there? Well, how many little grains of sand are there on the entire Earth? That's how many galaxies there are. The sands of the sea. Mm -hmm. I've got to be honest with you. A few months ago, I knew nothing about biblical astronomy. I mean, I have a stack of books here. I've actually read these. God's Voice in the Stars, God's Master Plan Revealed in the Stars, God's Word Written in the Stars, The Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, Hubble Legacy, The Gospel in the Stars, The Witness of the Stars. A lot of these books were written 100 years ago. And I've kind of read them, cursory reading, but I'd never looked through a telescope in my life. And until you got here, now I know you had a telescope. I did. You're giving a mondo now. <laughs> I did. <laughs> but until you got here, I really didn't have a lot of interest because I know where the North Star is and I can see the moon and the sun, and that's as far as it goes. And occasionally my wife will mention Venus. That Venus is visible. Mm -hmm. But I had no interest in it. And when you got here, you like opened my eyes to like a whole new world out there. And you're sending me pictures of galaxies and things that are so colorful and creative Beautiful. and amazing and spectacular. And you look at these things. Now, some people claim that these are all fake. These are all CGI images that NASA created. How do you respond to that? You know, I, I am glad you brought that up because we... we um, there, there's a whole group out there, and, and you see this, you know, many people are, are who are believers, and some are not, or, you know, they believe in a flat earth and other things, and they, they've come to, to claim that NASA has created this massive uh, worldwide conspiracy. Now, we're not here to defend NASA. I don't really care about NASA. But what I do care about is, is truth, in fact. And so it's interesting to me that for those that claim that all these pictures are false, some people believe that, Na that the Hubble Space Telescope is not real, and all again, all the pictures are photoshopped. So I look at that and I go, well, okay, you can believe what you want, but my response is, is have you looked through a telescope? And so when you see something that NASA has, let's say the Ring Nebula as an example. I remember 20 years ago having a telescope and you see this beautiful picture of this ring and then people claim that it's fake. And I go, well, I can go outside or Andromeda Galaxy is another example. You, the Andromeda Galaxy, you can see with the naked eye. You go up to Pegasus, you go two stars over, up to left, and there it is. So you can see this with the naked eye. So I, I'm shocked sometimes at people that maybe they get caught up in some of these views and they just don't know. Maybe they're, and that's really our heart is we want truth. And for those that are getting caught up in sort of this anti-scientific, again, our goal isn't to defend NASA, but I can, we can go out there, we pull this telescope out, we can go, oh, there's the Ring Nebula, you go right there, you look at the Hercules cluster, a lot of these things, and you can know exactly where it is, you can point the scope there, even through non-computerized scopes. So what I was doing this 20 years ago was without a computer. Now, man, you get the computerized mount, and you pop it in and you say, go to Andromeda, or go to the Hercules cluster, go to the Ring Nebula, go, go to this, boom. It goes right there. So all of these spectacular pictures that we're witnessing, this Hubble Legacy book that we have here in our bookstore, is just utterly shocking <laughs> to the imagination. Yeah. And from what I understand, our universe, correct me if I'm wrong, is still expanding. It's expanding, and uh, it's moving, and it's doing things. And if you read the Bible uh, with some knowledge of astronomy, not astrology, astronomy, if you read the Bible with some understanding of astronomy, God's plan is revealed. He becomes real. His glory is declared in the heavens. And it's, uh, there, ha there are people who have counterfeited astronomy. They've take, taken it and used it to predict uh, futures. And Try to, yeah. Horoscopes. 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 Yeah. That's, we're not interested in that. That's forbidden in the Old Testament. It is. Crystal clear. But we're looking we're, again. We're looking at the the we're looking at the broad picture. We have several angles of what we what we see biblical astronomy. It's certainly, Psalm 19 it declares God's glory. We also recognize again the the history of of the idea of a narrative being in in these in these constellations and what they've meant in history, and then trying to track that out. Sometimes it's pretty difficult, but you see the constellations being codified really going back to the third century, uh, which is interesting. And, and, and so we're, 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 we're researchers, we're looking to do this, but sometimes you just sit back and you go, 
I just want to look at it at the duck cluster. And you go, and you, you look at these things, and the Hercules cluster has hundreds of thousands of stars, and you can zoom in with your telescope to go in and out with the focus, and you're like, man, God, you're awesome. How many times do I say that? God, you're just awesome. Here I am small, but I can see it. Mondo has a good friend in Idaho uh, who has a telescope, and he's been sending Mondo these pictures that he forwarded to me. One of the pictures looks like a gigantic circular saw wheel and it's bright aquamarine and it almost looks like it's traveling through space yes. like literally cutting a path through space i just looked at it in just disbelief like wait a minute this is real the helix oh, yeah, nebula he took it with his own telescope yep. it's not from nasa it's not picture. from nasa yep and so i guess at the end of the day is are we all a bunch of liars and i just think i want to say well come on over to my house and and i can show you some of these things and again we're not here to defend NASA, because NASA, they're evolutionary, and we don't accept any of that. And so, again, we're not here, to, but we are here to declare the glory of God. So you take the Helix Nebula, and all you do is you go out, you find it, and you could sit there and record it with the time exposure with camera. It's stunning. God is awesome. And what else is stunning, and we don't have time to talk about it, is the fact that there are arrangements of stars in constellations that have a message. Yeah. And it's the message of salvation, right? Amen. Yeah, that's the history that we have. It's amazing. And yet in the middle of millions and billions and trillions and sextillions, I don't even know that's, where to that's, go from that there. That is the word. There's this tiny planet called Earth, which is just a speck in the universe. And this is where God sent his son to redeem the planet from the fall of Lucifer, the fall of Adam and Eve. We go back in ancient history to see how his hand has been at work here for the last several thousand years. So where are we going with all this? What, what's our interest in the stars and the heavens? There's a verse in, I think, Malachi 3.10 that talks about God opening the windows of heaven. Yeah. And our ministry has been blessed in an extraordinary way. Uh, we did a little update yesterday and talked about a couple from Georgia uh, who made a, an amazing contribution to the ministry to help us go back on the Daystar Network. Well, L.A. Marzoli always seems to be at the root of things we're doing here. He's a great friend of the ministry. We've known L.A. for, for many years now. And in fact, L.A. is the one responsible for actually bringing you here. He was the one that introduced us and suggested to me that Mondo would make a great partner for Gary. And next thing you know, it's been a year now since it's you've been, been here. here. But just recently, and I go back to the comment I made about God meeting you at different places on the road of life, uh, we met a gentleman here just a few months ago who came to us through L.A. Marzoli, following our programs with L.A. about UFO disclosure on the program, yeah. the interviews you did. And uh, this gentleman got really excited about UFO disclosure. In fact, we found out later that he has followed the whole UFO you know, phenomenon for many years, but never really fully understood it until he met L.A. and Gary and Mondo and kind of revealing some of the, the real stories behind this. Well, he got so excited about what we were doing here that he decided to help us build, I mean, drum roll here, literally build a world-class observatory here in Oklahoma City. And this gentleman has made a significantly large contribution to help us acquire two world-class telescopes, an observatory, all the astrophotography equipment to actually photograph the stars in the heavens, the galaxies, and Apophis. Now, I want you to talk about that. Are we actually going to be able to see Apophis? You, well, I would absolutely, 100%. I mean, the, the, the mount that we are getting um, is an extremely, it's a robotic mount. It's got absolute encoders on it. I won't geek you out with all this stuff. But 50 degrees per second, it'll track uh, satellites, you know, all the, the uh, Starlink satellites. You can download all the orbit in, orbital information, put it in, and boom, you can track stuff. You can track the, the International Space Station. I mean, this, this isn't make-believe. I mean, and a lot of people have, have trouble with this. But absolutely, people have already photographed Apophis. And so um, in the astronomy software, again, all these things. Th this is where I, I appreciate science. Um, and this is where when people make claims, we, we're going to go, well, we'll test it. We don't need Hubble's photographs. We'll get our own. We don't need uh, Hubble's um, uh, photographs of Apophis. We'll get our own. We'll track it. And, and so th at the end of the day, uh, we believe that God is the creator. 
And yeah. it brings glory to him from, from the macro of the size of the universe down to the micro, you know, the, 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 tele, the uh, microscopes and, and looking at quantum theory and other things. So we're here, to, we're, we're here to test it all. And again, by God's grace, the thing that's interesting to me is you have people that, uh, like this particular gentleman and others, that they recognize like, for their grandkids. They go, hey, we know that it's these fringe topics that are drawing them in and their kids, as they're talking to them, they're, they want them to know Jesus. And they're, they, they're using some of these other topics to not only to, for themselves to grow closer to God, to have a biblical worldview, but they're going, we want to be able to share this with our grandkids. We want them to know Jesus. And sometimes they won't go to church and they won't listen, as we were mentioning. Hey, here's a class on the theology of the book of Hebrews. Well, I love that, but that's not necessarily going to draw their kids in. But something like Apophis or yeah. the stars... Or, well, the Bible talks about this? Yes. I have to insert something here for your comment, and that is, do you remember uh, th those guys uh, over in the uh, area of Persia who uh -huh. studied the heavens, yeah. and God revealed to them that the Messiah was coming, and they watched the stars. And when the stars got to a certain place, they packed up, and they headed for where? <laughs> Bethlehem and they saw a what? A star and this is to illustrate that what God is doing is written in the heavens and a lot of people have been steered wrong by astrology that, that evil things are uh, conjured up by studying various constellations and birth dates and death dates and so forth and so on my Bible doesn't talk about that it talks about the coming of the Messiah and, the, and that, that being foretold in the stars. And I think it's in that spirit that you watch the heavens, right? Absolutely. I mean, you go back to Matthew chapter 2 with the Magi, and these guys were, they were, I mean, we, the, the understanding of the heavens in, in ancient times was pretty astounding as, as much as we might it not was. guess. But they saw something unusual. The, the heavens are very predictable. If you know, I mean, you you can see the the eighteen point six two lunar cycle, and you can see how the how the everything is is so um, again to use the word predictable. So when something, if I'm out at night and I know where Jupiter is or Saturn is or Venus is very bright, and you see something that you're like, hey, that's what is that? That's not supposed to be there. Because you're familiar with it. And a lot of people, unfortunately, they don't get out and look. They're not familiar with it. And sometimes I'm like, what is that? And then, oh, it ends up being a plane. Oh, okay. But at first, I recognized that that's not supposed to be there. And then, of course, the plane comes and it's coming straight on for five or ten minutes and it goes. So here these magi were. They see something. They were in the east. And they see something show up. And they're like, hey, that's not supposed to be there. But our, the, if we remember the magi... How did the Magi get their, a lot of their information? Daniel. That's Daniel right. was mm -hmm. part of that group in the 6th century B.C., and they had these records, and all of a sudden now they come traveling to the West because they saw something out of the ordinary, and it leads them eventually to Bethlehem. And our Lord is coming again. Will it be foretold in the heavens? It will. Will we be able to see it? I don't know, but we'll be watching, right? Well, Revelation <laughs> 8 talks about uh, a gigantic mountain that comes hurtling yeah. to earth, poisons one-third of the waters on earth. It's called wormwood. Is the asteroid Apophis another word for wormwood? Is that what we're witnessing here? It's not scheduled to be here until 2029. Some people think that's actually during the tribulation. Now, we're certainly not date setters here. Uh, Tom Horn had a dream about this, you know, some time ago. Uh, NASA confirms the arrival date. And when you read Revelation 8 and you read about Wormwood, I mean, what else could this possibly be? A mountain coming out of the sky. How big is uh, Apophis? It's over a thousand feet wide, according to current estimates, which that could change a little bit. Now, this isn't the first time an asteroid has hit this planet. It's it? not. I want you to talk about the Yucatan Peninsula. Well, briefly. Next to the Yucatan Peninsula is a huge crater under the Gulf of Mexico. It's huge. And uh, the evidence that accompanies this crater 
is a layer, a fallout layer of debris that encircles the entire globe. And an asteroid debris? Asteroid debris. And uh, that was a global situation. In other words, this world has interacted with the stars of heaven, if you will, in the past. And God has acted out in wrath to sinful man. Uh, the book of Revelation says he's going to do it again, more than once. And we're interested in the times and the seasons, and we're simply watching the heavens. You know, we are, after all, and we call ourselves prophecy watchers, Bob. Gary, you know that crater you talk about? Yeah. It's not just any old crater. It's several miles deep and 112 miles wide. That's right. So I'm sure the asteroid was big, but it hit the Earth with 100 trillion tons of TNT. Hmm. I mean, more force than all the nuclear weapons that exist in the world today, and it created mass destruction. Now, when did that happen in the last 6,000 years? I'm not going to take that question any further. But when it happened, it was a tragedy. It was a human disaster beyond anything maybe this world has ever seen, yeah. except for the fact that another asteroid hit the Canadian Arctic in the ancient past and left a crater even bigger. So it's not the first time that this would be part of a God's plan for this planet. We can go to Arizona. I mean, you can drive by. It's on I-40. You can go to the, the big crater in Arizona. I was there actually about six months that's ago. That's a mini crater. That's a mini. Well, I'm just saying it's huge. You look at the moon. I mean, that's beautiful if you get some telescope out or even your binoculars out. The moon has been bombarded. Uh, gigantic craters that are there, too. So a lot of the history of our world, uh, of our solar system, if you want to say it that way, is unknown. But we see, we see little pieces of evidence of, of that description. So it's, it's, this is fun, it's fun. Can you tell these two guys are a little bit excited? Now, you're a, an astronomy nut and have been forever. I mean, you've had your own telescope, you've searched the heavens. I mean, what we're doing here is just, it's, tel it's your telescope on steroids. I mean, this is literally a world-class telescope that this gentleman has provided. We're gonna be able to see things that we could never have dreamed or hoped for. Well, <clears throat> The mistake that a lot of people make uh, is when they hear that the heavens declare the glory of God, that they, uh, they think, well, that probably means that when I go out and look at the stars at night, I'm just bowled over by the beauty of them, particularly if you're out in the country in a dark night. But I think it means a lot more than that. It means that the actions of God can be traced in the heavens. And God doesn't necessarily always bless the earth. There have been rebellions on planet Earth, and, and uh, huge asteroids have, uh, have struck the planet, and the book of Revelation says it's going to happen again. So God's glory can be either a blessing, or if you're against God, it can be a curse. He can send things to Earth that you probably don't want to see. And all of this goes together to make a message. And, and the message to me is uh, God is favoring those who believe in him and who understand him and follow him and look for the coming of his son, Jesus. Amen. The August issue of the Prophecy Watcher magazine. If you're not a subscriber, you're going to miss maybe one of our best issues ever. Uh, it reveals the entire Psalm 19 project that we are rolled out. Our tel first telescope should be here in about two weeks. Uh, the observatory planning is underway. Um, God has opened the windows of heaven. I, mm. I call it, uh, he's given us a convertible. I mean, we literally are gonna be able to look up far past what we see with our eyes oh. and look into the deep, distant outer space and see things that God has put out there that when we start posting the pictures, and this is gonna become a regular column mm -hmm. in the magazine, that Mondo and Gary are going to contribute to. Uh, we're going to take our own pictures. These are not photoshopped. These are not NASA. This is not CGI. These are pictures taken with the Prophecy Watcher. Uh, what did you call it, Gary? The, uh, the uh, Star Watcher. We don't have a name quite yet for the, for the telescope, but we're going to be scanning the heavens, you know, with one purpose, to show the glory of God, to show the creative power of God, uh, to lead people to Jesus. 
in, in different ways at different points in life. Any final thoughts? You know, I'll just for those that are interested, we actually uh, we have a six inch uh, triplet re aperochromatic refractor. Uh, if you want to know the details, the other one is a 12.5 inch uh, Schmidt caster grain scope that is going to be on a fully robotic mount and they'll be able to look at the same thing together. And so we'll be able to take pictures at different um, focal lengths. And uh, th this, this is like just a dream come true in the sense of and God providing and God guiding for us to, again, to bring Him glory. This is just a tremendous opportunity. A new way to share the gospel. It really is. Well, what do we always say at the end of these programs? Our motto, keep watching. <laughs> we are...